NAGPRA is a human rights statute. It is a process. It's a tool. Level playing field uh, and uh, bring the ancestors back home. It's about relationships. NAGPRA is civil rights legislation. NAGPRA itself outlines the expectation of tribes and museums. A reconciliation that they were not collectibles, that they were not specimens, but they were, uh, they were uh, ancestors of people who are alive now. Hello, I'm Jamie Lavallee, and I'm the Notice Coordinator with the National Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act program, or the National NAGPRA program. This segment provides an overview of NAGPRA notices. A notice is a printed announcement, a NAGPRA notice is a printed announcement of a federal agency or museum's decision on Native American human remains and cultural items. It either establishes the rights to request or it reflects their agreement to transfer control of Native American human remains and cultural items. We'll discuss the two types of notices used in NAGPRA, notices of intended disposition and Federal Register notices, and review what information each type of notice should contain. We'll also go through the steps needed to publish a NAGPRA notice. NAGPRA was created to address the rights of lineal descendants, Indian tribes, including Alaska Native villages and corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations to their ancestors and cultural items. For ease of reference throughout this segment, I may refer to all of these as Indian tribes. NAGPRA applies to federal agencies and museums. A federal agency under NAGPRA encompasses all federal agencies except the Smithsonian. What is considered a museum under NAGPRA is pretty broad. It refers to all entities that receive federal funds and have possession of or control over Native American human remains and cultural items. Well, the notice is really important and that's like the accumulation of all your work, I think. And in my office, on my little like uh, board, I have all my notices I've helped get published. And it's like my little trophies. And I think only people in the NAGPRA world would understand this. You know, I tell Jamie, I was like, yeah, I got 14 you know, posted on my board. And I got big X's through them, the ones that are done, completed, buried, items returned. The ones that don't have X's you know, are still works in progress, but you know, we're going to get them back. Notices are a critical part of the NAGPRA process because they allow the opportunity to comment on a decision by the federal agency or museum regarding Native American human remains or cultural items in their collection before a transfer control or repatriation occurs. NAGPRA notices are also important as they are the way to return Native American human remains and cultural items that protects the integrity of museums, federal agencies, and tribes and ensures that human remains and cultural items are returned in culturally and spiritually appropriate ways. Let's discuss the two types of notices. Newspaper notices of intended disposition and Federal Register notices. First, we'll talk about notices of intended disposition. Notices of intended disposition are only applicable to Federal agencies and deal with human remains or cultural items removed from Federal or Tribal lands after November 16, 1990. They contain the federal agency's determination of control or custody of the Native American human remains or cultural items. Notices of intended disposition allow tribes to claim the Native American human remains and cultural items. Federal agencies must follow a certain hierarchy called a priority of custody or control when making a determination of disposition for human remains and cultural items or to resolve competing claims. The first priority is to the lineal descendant. This requires an unbroken chain of descendancy between the human remains and the claimant. Second on the priority list is to the Indian tribal landowner. If there are no lineal descendants or the discovery is not on tribal land, then third on the list is the culturally affiliated Indian tribe. If the federal agency does not have these priority claimants, then the federal agency looks to the tribe that aboriginally occupied the area unless there is an Indian tribe with a stronger cultural relationship to the human remains and cultural items. 
Once the federal agency has made a determination according to the priority of control, the notice of intended disposition is published. A notice of intended disposition must contain four elements. Information about the human remains and cultural items that were found at the site, the determination of control, the reason why that determination of control was made, and the contact information for the federal agency. Notices of intended disposition must be published in a newspaper of general circulation. General circulation means a newspaper that the general public reads. It can be a national, regional, local, or tribal newspaper that is distributed in the area of removal or in the area where the tribes that may control the human remains and cultural items are located. This means that federal agencies sometimes publish a notice of intended disposition in more than one newspaper. Regardless of whether or not they publish in more than one newspaper, they must publish the notice of intended disposition twice with at least one week between each publication. After the second publication, the federal agency must wait at least 30 days before transferring the human remains or cultural items to the Indian tribe. Copies of both publications are sent to the National NAGPRA program. The copies can be an affidavit, a publication, or a cutout of the actual publication. The name of the newspaper and the dates of publication should be included, and the notice should be readable. There is a template available on the National NAGPRA program's website that lists all the necessary information that is included for a notice of intended disposition. The National NAGPRA program's website also lists all the notices of intended disposition that are received. Therefore, if you are a federal agency official, it's a good idea to check it periodically to ensure that the National NAGPRA program has received all of your agency's copies of notices of intended disposition. Right now, you may be wondering why it is so important to notify others. What is the benefit? What actually happens with these notices? Let's take a look at the experience of the Bureau of Land Management a federal agency that has completed many notices of intended disposition. Here to provide us with their experience is Emily Paulus, National Curator and NAGPRA Coordinator for the BLM. We had an instance, which was very interesting, where we published a notice of intended disposition for remains that were actually identified in faunal collections in um, materials that were excavated after 1990. A review of the faunal collections found human remains. So we moved forward with the new discovery section of, of the process and did a notice of, of intended disposition that was based on Aboriginal land as determined by the Indian Claims Commission. We published the notice affiliating uh, with or associating with one tribe as Aboriginal land and during the public during the 30 days that the notice was out for publication in local and regional newspapers, another tribe came forward and made a claim for those same remains. And it came down to a very close review of, ab of the Aboriginal land jurisdiction lines as determined by the Indian Claims Commission. We reviewed all of the information, the maps again, and found that the tribe that came forward during the, pub during the publication process was indeed, in fact, the. Um, had the, be the stronger claim to the remains. And so we published a notice um, basically explaining uh, a change in the agency's decision and explaining the reasons why. As the BLM discovered, publishing a notice of intended disposition resulted in a change of their determination of control because of the additional information that was provided afterwards. Now that we've discussed notices of intended disposition, let's talk about Federal Register notices. What is the Federal Register? The Federal Register is the official journal of the United States government that contains most of its publications and public notices of government agencies, including proposed regulations, final rules, meeting notices, review committee nomination solicitations, and in this situation, NAGPRA notices. There are two important distinctions between a Federal Register notice and a notice of intended disposition. First, Federal Register notices must be done by both federal agencies and museums. There's a broad definition for museums under NAGPRA. 
basically, if you have possession of or control over Native American human remains or cultural items and you receive federal funds, then you are a museum. This means a museum can be a university, Department of Anthropology, a state agency, police department, city library, or coroner's office. The second difference is that Federal Register notices are published by the National NAGPRA program for the museum and federal agency as part of their administrative duties. A Federal Register notice contains a museum and federal agency's decision about repatriation or disposition and reflects the agreement to transfer control of the human remains and cultural items to a particular Indian tribe or tribes. It allows other claimants the opportunity to contact the museum or federal agency if they have competing claims or other relevant information about the Native American human remains or cultural items. If you are the originator of the notice and you've consulted with tribes and created and completed an inventory, you can publish a notice. If you wait at least the 30 days required after publication before transferring control and you do not receive any completing claims regarding the notice, then you can go forward confident that you've covered all the NAGPRA requirements. Well, what exactly is a Federal Register Notice? There are actually two types of Federal Register Notices. Notice of Inventory Completion and Notice of Intent to Repatriate Cultural Items. Notices of Inventory Completion deal with Native American human remains and associated funerary objects. Notices of Intent to Repatriate deal with unassociated funerary objects sacred objects, and objects of cultural patrimony. At the Burke Museum, we have done both notices of inventory completion and notices of intent to repatriate. What I think is important, I think a lot of the communities I've worked with and a lot of the other museums I've worked with don't understand the difference between those two documents. And I think that's a really important, there's a fundamental difference in that one requires a claim. The notice of intent to repatriate requires an action from the tribe. So you need a claim letter from the tribe that claiming the, s the specific cultural items and the information about that claim. Um, now, the notice of intent to re the inventory sorry the notice of inventory completion um, is really a, about the museum's decision, um, making a decision of cultural affiliation. And so those processes are similar, but they are definitely separate. And so I think that's important to understand. Anybody that is writing a notice at the outset to understand the differences between those and notice that the different the no two notices are very different in nature as well. Um, in terms of when the consultation takes place um, and who must be notified at the publication of that notice as well. Before you can write either Federal Register notice, you must create a certain document before starting. A notice of inventory completion needs an inventory, and a notice of intent to repatriate requires a summary. What is an inventory? An inventory is an item-by-item -item description of the human remains and associated funerary objects in a museum or federal agency's collection with its cultural affiliation determination. There are two types of inventory lists, culturally affiliated and culturally unidentifiable. Depending on a museum or federal agency's determination, they can create either one inventory list or both. When the cultural affiliation of the Native American human remains and associated funerary objects can be determined to an Indian tribe on a reasonable basis, given the totality of the circumstances, then the Native American human remains and associated funerary objects are culturally affiliated and submitted in a culturally affiliated inventory. If the cultural affiliation can't be determined, then the individual entry is submitted in a culturally unidentifiable inventory. Either inventory can be amended based on additional consultation or evidence. What is cultural affiliation? Cultural affiliation means that there is a relationship of shared group identity that can be reasonably traced historically or prehistorically between members of a present-day Indian tribe or Native Hawaiian organization and an identifiable earlier group. Cultural affiliation is established when the preponderance of the evidence based on geographical, kinship, biological, archaeological, anthropological, linguistic, folklore, oral tradition, 
historical evidence, or other information or expert opinion reasonably leads to such a conclusion. Repatriation is the term used for the transfer of control when the Native American human remains and associated funerary objects are being returned to a culturally affiliated tribe or tribes. What does culturally unidentifiable mean? Culturally unidentifiable refers to human remains and associated funerary objects in museum or federal agency collections for which no lineal descendant or culturally affiliated Indian tribe or Native Hawaiian organization has been identified through the inventory process. Disposition is a term for the transfer of control of culturally unidentifiable Native American human remains to a tribe or tribes. There are some basic questions you need to answer when going through the inventory process. The answers are subsequently used to write a notice of inventory completion. They are, are the human remains Native American? What is the identifiable earlier group? What Native American group would these human remains have descended from? What is the present day Indian tribe to whom they are culturally affiliated? What is the cultural connection between the present day tribe and the identifiable earlier group? How did you make this determination with which tribe or tribes did you consult with? And what evidence did you use? These are the types of evidence that can be used to come to a determination of cultural affiliation based on a reasonable basis given the totality of the circumstances. They are geographical, kinship, biological, archaeological, linguistic, folklore, oral tradition, historical evidence, or other information or expert opinion. They are not in priority order. They do have equal weight, although not all may apply in coming to determination depending on the facts available and consultation with tribes. Most of this information will be used in the notice of inventory completion. The more complete the information in your inventory, the easier and faster it will be to create the notice of inventory completion. Inventories were to be completed by November 16, 1995 and submitted to the tribes and the National NAGPRA program. As of April 20, 2007, if a museum or federal agency finds or receives more Native American human remains or associated funerary objects that are not on an inventory, they must submit an updated inventory within two years of receiving or finding them. Museums that weren't subject to NAGPRA on November 16, 1990, but since that time have received federal funds and have possession of or control over Native American human remains and associated funerary objects have five years to do the inventory process. There are over 1,100 NAGPRA inventories that have been submitted by museums and federal agencies, and the program continues to receive updated inventories. Information about what should be included in an inventory is available on the National NAGPRA Program's website. Now that we've outlined the inventory process and what is included in an inventory, we'll discuss what goes into a notice of inventory completion. A notice of inventory completion is done after the museum or federal agency has completed their inventory, which contains their consultation efforts, information as to whether the human remains are culturally affiliated or culturally unidentifiable, how and why this was a determination, and how many individuals, associated funerary objects, there are in this determination. Once a museum or federal agency makes a determination and completes their inventory, and the determination is that the human remains and associated funerary objects are culturally affiliated, then they have an affirmative obligation to submit a notice of inventory completion for publication in the Federal Register to the National NAGPRA program. Our strategy for approaching NAGPRA has really been to be um, very proactive on the consultation side of things. And so um, we try
try and develop, a, we try and work with the communities and indicate, to indicate if there are going to be any stumbling box blocks later on or if there are any sensitive words that um, might be an issue to use in that, in that notice um, or anything else to avoid or to definitely include that are important. Sometimes there's a key term that I might not be aware of the um, politics behind that term or the sensitivity behind that term and that's really important for me to know and so we try and have those conversations before I even write the notice or certainly before I submit the notice. The regulation on the disposition of culturally unidentifiable Native American human remains took effect on May 14, 2010. This rule does not change the previously existing obligation to consult with tribes in compiling an inventory. The rule takes a culturally unidentifiable inventory and provides for disposition of the human remains on that list. The culturally unidentifiable inventory of the museum or federal agency is disposition to the following in priority order. To the tribe or tribes from whose tribal lands at the time of the removal the Native American human remains and associated funerary objects were removed. To the tribe or tribes from whose Aboriginal lands, the human remains, and associated funerary objects were removed. Aboriginal land can be determined using a final judgment of the Indian Claims Commission or the United States Court of Claims, a treaty, an act of Congress, or executive order, or other relevant information or evidence. This is not to say that if the Native American human remains were removed from tribal or Aboriginal land, that they are automatically culturally unidentifiable. They could be culturally affiliated because a tribe has a connection to the human remains which results in a determination of culturally affiliated. Next, a museum or federal agency, if there are no tribal or Aboriginal land tribes that claim the human remains, may disposition the culturally unidentifiable human remains to another federally recognized tribe or tribes. Finally, the museum or federal agency again if there are no tribal or Aboriginal land tribes, may also ask the Secretary of the Interior to disposition the human remains to a non-federally recognized Indian group or reinter the human remains. If a decision or agreement about the transfer of control of the culturally unidentifiable Native American human remains is reached between the museum or federal agency and a tribe or tribes, then the museum or agency goes forth with a notice of inventory completion. Notices of inventory completion deal with Native American human remains and associated funerary objects, and each notice must contain certain elements that are also in your inventory. A notice of inventory completion contains the full name of the museum or federal agency, including the state and the city where the museum or federal agency is located. If known, the site county and state of where the human remains or associated funerary objects were removed. If known, the date of removal and the collector, the minimum number of individuals and associated funerary objects, how the human remains and associated funerary objects came to be in the control of the museum or federal agency, the basis for finding cultural affiliation and shared group identity, or the reason for the disposition of the culturally unidentifiable, and any other relevant information that the museum or federal agency might have about the Native American human remains or associated funerary objects. There is a template available on our website and a database of all notices of inventory completion that have been published in the Federal Register. If this is your first time doing a notice, or it's been a while, I'd suggest using the most recent template and reading a few of the recently published notices to get an idea of how to proceed. In the end, the entirety of your culturally affiliated inventory and much of your culturally unidentifiable inventory must be represented in a notice or notices of inventory completion. This means a museum or federal agency that has a lot of human remains in their collection could have many notices of inventory completion. Why could there be more than one notice for your inventory? Because each notice of inventory completion refers to one site or group of sites that have the same cultural affiliation determination or disposition of culturally unidentifiable. To recap, notices of inventory completion 
deal with human remains and associated funerary objects, work off of a museum or federal agency's inventory, and reflect the federal agency or museum's decision about the cultural affiliation or disposition. If an inventory is an item-by-item -item description of your collection and consultation efforts, then a notice of inventory completion is a story or brief narrative of the inventory. The publication of a notice acknowledges the rights of the listed tribe or tribes to receive the Native American human remains and associated funerary objects. This is the critical step necessary to show the museum or federal agency decision to repatriate or disposition human remains in associated funerary objects. So I sit down with all of the relevant documentation and all of the other tools that I'm going to need. Um, the, the template for the notice of inventory completion of, or notice of intent to repatriate that's on National NAGPRA's website, uh, the museum's uh, inventory um, through our computerized database, um, as well as published documents and our geographic information system database as well um, that we've developed in order to review um, claims as they have come in and to review cultural inf affiliation information. Uh, then I go through paragraph pa by paragraph. Um, I determine, I look to see what tribes we've consulted with. Um, I, I look through and that I can find that in both in our museum database um, as well as we keep a running tally um, based on counties, what tribes we typically consult with. Um, and then the just follow through paragraph by paragraph in that notice, um, summarizing the collection. Um, when it was collected, um, how many, the minimum number of individuals that were found at that, um, at that particular site, um, and all of the accessioning information that's relevant there as well. Um, and then I go ahead and do the cultural affiliation paragraph, um, describing the, how one particular group has a cultural relationship with that place or those set of human remains and funerary objects. Um, and then I just work my way through it. I do feel it's really important, once I have completed that process, to share that draft with the tribe I'm working with before it goes to National NAGPRA for review. Um, oftentimes the tribe assists me greatly in coming up with really concrete information to add to that to make it a more complete notice. Um, and I'm very appreciative of that, and I think that's a good step in the process that's not required, but I do think that that's an important part of it. Next, we'll talk about the other Federal Register notice, which is called a Notice of Intent to Repatriate Cultural Items. This notice also resolves from consultation with tribes and acknowledges the rights of the listed tribes to repatriate cultural items. Like a notice of inventory completion, it reflects a federal agency or museum's decision about the cultural items. A summary is the starting point for a notice of intent to repatriate. What is a summary? A summary is a brief listing, not an item-by-item -item description, of the cultural items in the museum or agency's collection. A summary does not reflect a cultural affiliation decision or even state the cultural items described are NAGPRA items. Instead, a summary contains an estimated number of the objects in the collection, reference to their geographical location, a description of the kinds of objects that are in the collection, a reference to the means, dates, or locations, if known, in which the collection or portion of the collection was acquired, and any other relevant information to identifying the cultural affiliation. Well, summaries you kind of use in conjunction with inventories. You know, if there's additional information, um, you know, no more information, the better. A lot of times there's very scant information for these collections. So if there's a summary and they go through and find a catalog card that says, you know, so-and-so was out collecting, so to speak, in a certain area, then that's like a little bit more information we have because then we can look at the collector and where they you know, have been known to collect, what tribes predominantly they collect from, and what are their methods of collecting. You know, some, one museum might have a little bit of documentation on this individual, but another museum might have a ton, like, oh, geez, he was buying all these items from this family, and then he was out, you know, purchasing grave goods from this individual. So we can use that, you know, in conjunction with this other museum, saying, well, we have other information about this individual. So it's probable that it says, like, copper bracelet, Ottawa. Well, it's probable it's from a grave because he was c collecting other copper bracelets from known Ottawa graves, you know, maybe four counties south of us. So that's really important to have when you're trying to put together a strong claim. 
Summaries were due to the tribes and the National NAGPRA program by November 16, 1993. As of April 20, 2007, if a museum or federal agency receives or finds additional cultural items, they have six months to do an update to their summary. New museums have three years to complete the summary process. A notice of intent to repatriate is the result of the summary process. What is the summary process? First, the museum or federal agency compiles the information about the cultural items in a summary and sends it to all potentially affiliated tribes and the National NAGPRA program. After reviewing the summary, a tribe may contact the federal agency or museum to ask for more information on a specific cultural item and to consult about it. During consultation, the federal agency or museum usually receives additional information from a tribe about the cultural item. As a result, a museum or federal agency may then receive a claim from the Indian tribe asking for the repatriation of the cultural item. The museum or federal agency has 90 days once they receive this claim to make a decision about repatriation of the object. In order to make their decision, a few basic questions need to be answered by the federal agency or museum. Does the claimant have standing to make the claim? Does the object fit at least one of three NAGPRA categories? Is the tribe culturally affiliated to the object? What are the three NAGPRA categories? The first category is unassociated funerary objects. In general, funerary objects are part of the death rite or ceremony of a culture and are reasonably believed to have been placed with or near individual human remains either at the time of death or later. As mentioned earlier, notices of inventory completion deal with Native American human remains and associated funerary objects. But in a notice of intent to repatriate, unassociated funerary objects are described. What's the difference between these two? For unassociated funerary objects, the human remains are no longer in the possession or control of a museum or federal agency. An example would be a museum that housed the Native American human remains and their associated funerary objects in separate buildings. If the building that housed the Native American human remains burnt down, this now means that the once associated funerary objects are now considered unassociated funerary objects since the human remains are no longer in the possession or control of any museum or federal agency under NAGPRA. The second category is sacred objects. Sacred objects are specific ceremonial objects needed by traditional Native American religious leaders for the practice of traditional Native American religions by their present-day adherents. What does this mean? Sacred objects can be pipes, medicine pouches, clothing like vestments, or other objects. A sacred object can be owned by a tribe or a single individual. There are two important points to remember about sacred objects. First, the museum or federal agency does not need to be told of or understand the ceremonial use of the object, only that it is needed. Second, the ceremony may have been dormant due to the loss of the object but may be renewed upon return of the object. The third category are objects of cultural patrimony. These are objects that have ongoing historical, traditional, or cultural importance, are central to the Native American group or the cultural itself, could not have been alienated, appropriated, or conveyed by any individual, and at the time of removal from the culture, were considered inalienable from the group. For the citizens of the United States, an object of cultural patrimony would be the Liberty Bell or the Statue of Liberty. For Native American tribes, it could be any object that is considered of cultural importance that is central to them. For example, a notice of intent to repatriate was published in 2006 by the Trustees of Reservations for an object of cultural patrimony for the Stockbridge Muncie community. The object of cultural patrimony was a four-piece communion set. Why would this be an object of cultural patrimony? Because back in the 1800s, the communion set was already part of the history of the Stockbridge Muncie and was an integral part of their community 
and culture when it was removed from the tribe. Finally, no one in the tribe had the right to take it or give it away. In present day times, it continues to have historical and cultural significance to the tribe. Therefore, it meets all the elements for being an object of cultural patrimony. There's an important distinction to note here between a sacred object and an object of cultural patrimony. A sacred object might be owned by an individual, and that individual may have the right to give it away. However, no object of cultural patrimony is owned by an individual, and therefore it can never be given away. Sometimes an object can be both a sacred object and an object of cultural patrimony. This means it needs to fit the elements of both categories. For example, in August 2008, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science published a notice of intent to repatriate about an object that was both a sacred object and an object of cultural patrimony to the Pueblo of Cochiti. This object was a piki stone that was used to make a certain kind of bread for special ceremonies. It was shown through consultation that there were traditional religious leaders that needed the stone. It was used for special ceremonies and there were present day adherents. Further, they also showed that the stone was an object of cultural patrimony. This particular stone was special and was used for the entire community. It was stored in a communal house at the time it was removed. No one had the right to give it away. Finally, it still had ongoing historical, traditional, and cultural importance that it had when it was removed. The Denver Museum of Nature and Science determined that the stone fulfilled all the elements of the definitions for both sacred object and object of cultural patrimony. Now we'll discuss the basic content of Notice of Intent to Repatriate. Part 1 of a Notice of Intent to Repatriate lists the category of cultural item. Unassociated funerary object, sacred object, object of cultural patrimony, or combination as well as a total number of cultural items listed to be repatriated. The second part of the notice explains why the item or items fit a NAGPRA category. Are they funerary objects because they were removed from where Native American human remains were and unassociated because the human remains are not in the possession or control of the museum or federal agency? Are they sacred objects because they are needed for ceremonial purposes? Is it an object of cultural patrimony because it is something that is integral and central to that Indian tribe, could not have been given away by any individual and was considered to be inalienable at the time of the removal? Or does the object fit a combination of more than one of these categories? Once the category is known and the reason why it fits a category is described, then the next part of the notice describes where the cultural items are from, if that is known, how it came to be in the control of the museum or federal agency if known, the cultural affiliation of the object, and any other relevant information. There is a template available on the National NAGPRA Program website, as well as a Notices of Intent to Repatriate Cultural Items database available for you to read. Yeah, so when I sit down to do a notice, I will go to the National NAGPRA website, get their template, um, fill in all the necessary information, pull it from the museum's accession records and cards and from consultation with the tribes. And then uh, if I have any questions, I'll call Jamie at the National NAGPRA, and then I'll send her an email with the attachment and um, wait for her response. Now that you know that there are two different types of Federal Register notices, we're going to discuss the Federal Register notices process. What happens once you write the notice and submit it to the National NAGPRA program? As I mentioned earlier, Federal Register notices are published by the National NAGPRA program as part of their administrative duties. The only time a federal agency may fulfill their NAGPRA notice duties by just submitting a copy of their notice to the program is when a federal agency submits their copies of published notices of intended disposition. Any other time, a notice must undergo a technical review before it can be published in the Federal Register. Therefore, museums and federal agencies should expect to work closely with the National NAGPRA Program Notice Coordinator to complete their notice. In the first step, a draft of the Notice of Inventory Completion or Notice of Intent to Repatriate Cultural Items 
is submitted electronically by the museum or federal agency to the notice coordinator, who then assigns it a temporary tracking ID number. The museum or federal agency is emailed the ID number in confirmation of receipt. The museum or agency sends the original hard copy by mail. Once the museum or federal agency receives confirmation of receipt, the notice coordinator starts a technical review of the draft. The notice coordinator's first step is to match the inventory or summary records to the information that is contained in the draft notice. They then review the notice to ensure that all required information is included. The notice coordinator requests clarifications or sends questions to the museum or federal agency official about the inventory or summary records. Clarifications may also be required about the content of the notice if information is missing. There may be several drafts of the notice before it's put into a final version by the notice coordinator. This final version is sent to the museum or federal agency and must receive approval from the museum or federal agency official that is responsible for NAGPRA decisions. Once the approval has been received from the museum or federal agency, it goes through a few more administrative steps at our end and then is submitted to the Federal Register to publish. The museum or federal agency will receive notification from us that the notice is published. The museum or federal agency must then contact the tribes, letting them know that the notice has been published and that the 30-day wait period has started. After the 30 days have passed, the transfer of control of the Native American human remains or cultural items can occur. The process for preparing and submitting an, a notice uh, begins with um, finalizing the, the inventory or the summary information, um, inserting the appropriate language into the notice, whether it's a notice of intent to repatriate, notice of inventory completion, or a notice of intended disposition. Um, generally, that is completed uh, by the Bureau of Land Management field office or state office staff, uh, often with, with assistance from our Washington office, from myself. Uh, they submit it to me, and I review it to make sure that it meets the required uh, standards in the statute and, and the regulations. And then for notices that are to be published in the Federal Register, I then take the draft notice and the accompanying summary or inventory and submit it to the National NAGPRA program to Jamie Lavallee, who then uh, reviews it. Um, any questions that the National NAGPRA program has will get fielded back to me, and I'll review them, uh, consult with the field offices as necessary. And then once both the, the National NAGPRA program office and the BLM are comfortable with the information and the presentation of the information in the notice, um, I, as the NAGPRA coordinator for BLM, do a final approval for publication and then um, the National NAGPRA program uh, moves forward uh, with, with publication in the Federal Register. Um, the process is a little bit different for notices of intended disposition because those are published in newspapers as opposed to the Federal Register. So those are, again, prepared by the field offices or state offices, uh, whichever is applicable. And we u utilize the, uh, the template provided by the National NAGPRA program office and plug in the pertinent information. And then uh, we buy newspaper ads in local and regional newspapers, and we publish uh, twice, at least a week apart. NAGPRA notices are the way to return Native American human remains and cultural items that protects the integrity of museums, federal agencies, and tribes, and ensures that human remains and cultural items are returned in culturally and spiritually appropriate ways. The notice is the museum and federal agency's decision and reflects what is in their inventory or summary. The National NAGPRA program does not do determinations of cultural affiliation. Those decisions are up to the museum or the federal agency. We at the National NAGPRA program are here to help ensure that all necessary information is included in your notices and to review and answer any of your questions that you may have on notices of intended disposition, Federal Register notices, and the inventory or summary. Thank you. My name is Jamie Lavallee, and I'm the Notice Coordinator for the National NAGPRA Program. If you have any questions, please feel free to visit our website, email, or call. Thank you. I guess I want to say thank you to, to Congress for giving us NAGPRA. And I say it. <laughs> 
I say it in a, a weird way because I, I say it laughing like that because there's, there is criticism in Indian country of NAGPRA. But, um, and although I will sit here and tell you about the 123,000 sets of ancestral remains that haven't come home and this work that needs to be done, I can also tell you about, you know, the other sets of remains that have come home. And so, and, and the, setting this process um, into place. I think it's humbled me a lot because I had a lot of assumptions about what I thought I knew as an archaeologist and as a scientist and as a woman. And, uh, it has humbled me. I've been privileged to take part in events that I never would have imagined taking part in. And I've built some deep, lasting friendships and it's really helped me to uh, gain empathy for understanding belief systems that are not my own. And that's what's really, I think, important in a struggle with this is that I've heard so many times people say, well, what's the big deal? If it were my grandmother, I wouldn't care. Well, the big deal is it's not your grandmother, it's someone else's grandmother, and they do care. You know, and so I think building empathy is, and under, cross-cultural understanding has been pretty pivotal for me. The last reburial I did was, it was January. We just got the remains back. And it was from a disposition. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to have these hanging out in my office all winter, you know. So I got my snowshoes on and uh, threw them on my back, you know, and I had the shovel and I was like trekking through the woods and I was like, I hope the ground's unfroze. If not, I'm going to have to start a fire. But luckily, I started digging, the ground was unfrozen. You know, it's just like, cool, you know, you feel really good. You know, you're reburying, and, and the remains were all kids, you know, just like little itty-bitty skulls, and just little guys, you know. And they're from right down where I grew up in Mackinac City, which is like 20 miles from Cross Village. So this is like real personal. And it's like felt really good, you know, it's like I did something good today. You know, it's just like something I can be proud of. I call my mom, and she's all happy tell other people, I was like, oh, that's, that's a good thing. 